I was asked to talk about video and social media this morning, and um, I was thinking a lot about what does that mean, social media? I mean, obviously it means Facebook and social networking websites, but um, in, in a lot of ways, when it comes to video, really what you're, you're talking about is distribution, distribution platforms. How do you reach your audience? And um, I think I can speak to that basically through the experiences of the projects I've worked on, both at Spike and then with the Raps, and then um, some other things I've sort of observed as I've been thinking about ways to just be more effective at getting these, these, these creations of ours out into the world and having them seen and shared and talked about. So today I wanna, I'm gonna show you a couple things and, talk, and then uh, this, we can open it up for discussion and talk about them. Uh, the first is, uh, I was the creative director at Spike and um, in the last several years I oversaw their big award shows. So one of them was the Scream Awards. Has anybody seen the Scream Awards or heard of it? Okay, well. <laughs> Nobody watches award shows, so that was, it made it a challenge. Some of you might have seen this piece though. I did a shot for shot recreation of the original Back to the Future theatrical trailer. Now Back to the Future is my favorite movie of all time. And that's gonna play a lot into why I think this succeeded. Uh, but also having Michael J. Fox in it helped a little bit. Um, uh, so I'm gonna show you that and we're gonna talk about how that unfolded. Uh, another um, campaign that I oversaw was the promotion of the Video Game Awards, which maybe some of you have at least heard of. Um, also a problematic show because video games are mainly about being played, not being watched or watching people talking about them, which is even more derivative than watching them played or watching footage. Uh, but still, we launched a campaign called Look Closer as part of the 2010 uh, Video Game Awards, and it had a lot of success, at, particularly at the community, sort of digital community level in, in forums and Facebook, and, 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 then, and then the media layer above that, the, the blogs and, and news outlets that cover video game news. So we can talk about that. Of course, the Canes versus Hayek rap videos. Um, but if it was just them, it would really be one data point, so it's a little hard to jump for joy about that. Um, and, and then, you know, there's some other um, websites, uh, um, video brands that I've been paying attention to that I think are, offer some really good lessons that are somewhat, I think, repeatable. Because I don't think there's a lot that's repeatable about social media, because at the end of the day, what is social media? Social media is really just a set of web tools that let us talk to each other. So there, there isn't a thing, social media, that can really be uh, programmatically um, addressed or have some kind of formula applied to it that's going to work. It's, it's, it's no different than, well, how do you get people to talk about you? That's really all you're saying. And so there's a lot of ways that we can do it, and a lot of the ways that people have always done that still apply. And, and so that's gonna be the lessons that I've learned so far about this process of uh, trying to bridge the gap, move from sort of old media to new media, old media, so to speak, um, having worked in the networks for a decade, and now moving, and even while in the network over the past three years, the focus moving increasingly to these connected social platforms, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, etc. So I also added a lot more whiz-bang transitions to the presentation today, so we can enjoy those. Um, so here is uh, the Back to the Future trailer. So that's kind of my favorite thing ever. <laughs> um, uh, I don't really get all excited about celebrities, but that time I definitely did. <laughs> Uh, it, it was really neat. Now, he was actually filmed in a hotel room on the Upper East Side. So the entire, he was not actually there on the set. The reflections I had to add in Adobe After Effects. And one other little fun thing for me is the feet at the beginning are me. <laughs> there was no reason for it to be me other than I was geeking out on it and I wanted it to be me. I was like, only I know the pacing of that commercial. <laughs> um, so, 
during the during the um, the, the, the concept uh, concepting of that uh, piece, uh, which wasn't my original idea, well, the, the head writer at Spike found that trailer and said, "Oh, we should do something with this trailer," and then he started. You know, because we all tend to want to make something new, coming up with all these different script ideas for something we could do, and I, I don't even remember what they were. But as soon as I saw it, my my instant thought was, we have to do an exact frame by frame recreation of this, and it has to be exactly the same. And that little detail proved to be very important in, I think, how it was perceived and picked up, but. It was a detail that everybody else thought, well, it doesn't really need to be exactly the same. Nobody's going to remember this trailer. You know, I, I honestly hadn't even seen it before. So in, in that respect, they were definitely right. There was really no reason in a way to do it exactly the same. Just for it to kind of evoke the trailer would have probably been good enough in a sense. Um, but because I was a real geek about Back to the Future and I was so excited about it and wanted to really like pay tribute to it as best I could, it was very important. I mean, we spent so much time on the placement of the reflection before the hand comes in, and those type of little details. And I think that played in a very important role. And I think being a geek about stuff plays a very important role in how you find an audience in a world where you're both broadcasting, which is actually another thing about sort of the Facebook addition to what used to be just comments is the feed. You're actually, we're all broadcasters now. Um, and narrow casting, which is now you can also talk directly to people and target people directly and they have direct access to you. And that's very different. That's one of the things that's so different about um, the, the digital space is that intimacy. Um, so some of the things, now, now some of these things benefit dramatically from having a press department at Viacom. So there, these are, some of these are not repeatable. Uh, like getting featured on Entertainment Tonight, that was actually mostly the press department. Um, however, that wouldn't have guaranteed, and I don't think necessarily got so, seen by enough people to, to do what happened next, which is over 48 hours, it got over two and a half million views. I, I might be misremembering that. that might, it might have actually been three and a half million. Unfortunately, because Viacom has had an outstanding, and I think it's still going on, lawsuit with YouTube. YouTube pulled the clip off within that first weekend, which I won't get into it, but it just speaks to sort of the odd bedfellows that intellectual property in the 21st century presents and the challenges of communicating and even when you own the content, uh, getting it out there. So. Um, Going back to this shot-for-shot uh, shot precision, and, and I, I was hoping this would happen because it would sort of prove my case, and it did, which was people started reposting it with side-by-side, picture-in-picture, to be like, look, it's exactly the same. <laughs> and we're so excited about that, and so excited about that attention to detail, and you could see it in the comments, and, the, and, and multiple people took the time to find the old one, to download it into whatever little editing app they might be using, and then repost it with it side by side. Like, that's actually work. It might have taken like an hour and a half for somebody to do, for no reason, other than they're geeking out on it. Um, and then it got picked up very broadly. So here's just a little example of that side by side recreation. So it's, it's not exact because that, on our side on the left, it was a studio, not a real open space, so we had to adjust the camera because if we made the camera any lower to make that shot look closer to the truth, we would have seen the back, the back wall, um, which irks me because I really wanted it to be exactly the same. <laughs> so what, were my, what are the key takeaways from what I observed with this? And, and the other thing too is we'd been talking about how are we going to make something go viral? And one of the smartest people at Spike uh, <laughs> who just left, um, always used to say viral is not a strategy, it's an outcome. Saying I want something to go viral is not a goal other than the goal of, I want it to be good and lots of people to see it. Like, that's not a goal. It's like, I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna do something that sucks and nobody watches. Like, well, that's not a goal. It's not a strategy. It's an outcome. And it's surprising 
and again, this is, I'm speaking mainly from being inside a big media firm trying to grapple with getting their stuff seen. And they're facing the same things that we all face as we try to get our ideas out there. It's very hard to find stuff in a world with millions and millions of options and billions of video views happening every day and a stream that's always pushing you off the front page constantly, daily. And, you know, I've, I've said a lot of times in the past several years that now distribution is now free, which means that each of us can get as many views as MTV or Disney or, or, or Viacom or Paramount or any of the biggest players in the world. You can't really monetize it the way they can, but we can still reach an audience, and that's something completely new. But it hasn't, in, a, in, in some senses, lowered the true cost, the full price of reaching those people because it's so much harder to be discovered. You know, back in the days when there was three networks, you know, that barrier to entry also, also involved, there was only three networks and people liked watching television. So you were basically guaranteed tens of millions, perhaps even close to 100 million viewers for your, for your program. And we can thank the FCC for it being that way for so long great job they did with all, all that anti-corporate regulation. Um, but, but even though we can now compete with those guys directly, we have a hard time being discovered. I saw, an, uh, I, I, how many awesome videos have you seen that have like under a thousand views that are like, they're good. It's like, how does this, how did this not get discovered? Discovery is the new distribution. Where, where it was worrying about getting distributed was the thing. How am I gonna get my film distributed? Now it's how's anybody gonna find it? So it's, it's really like the price has moved off to the, another, another margin. Um, but we can still do it and that's a giant leap for everybody. So a big part of this was leveraging an existing fan base. I mean, I, you know, and, and I, me being a Back to the Future geek assumed there'd be millions of people that would love this and anything about Back to the Future and it was the 25th anniversary so that we also had sort of a cultural zeitgeist slash heavy marketing effort going on, um, not just at Spike, but um, the, uh, the, uh, the movie studio as part of a DVD re-release and stuff like that. Um, but I was surprised how many people at the network thought like, well, this movie was like, it's like 30 years old or 25 years old and nobody's gonna, uh, do people really care about this? I mean, I'm, I wasn't even sure if the, 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 the EVP of, of events, the person that ran the show, she might not have even seen the movie, which is even more horrifying for me. But, um, but they weren't sure that that was gonna happen, that it, that it would get as much excitement as it did. And that is uh, sort of surprising, but I think it also just speaks to the power of um, communities and communities in this new sense where it's not a community by geography, it's a community by interest. And everybody in this room is part of that. Anybody that likes Austrian economics is part of a community of interest that's obviously incredibly passionate and dispersed and um, excited for anything cool that comes out about it. Um, featuring a celebrity helped a lot, no question about it. Uh, not easy for people to do. So that's a high barrier to entry for, for using, using that technique. But when you can, it's really helpful. And yeah, being authentically geeky. So it's not just, it's not like, like, I think yesterday I talked about how when I was at Nickelodeon, we used to say, that, you know, we used to say we can't say fun, we have to be fun and show actual fun happening. And similarly, you can't say, I'm going to make something for the geeks. It's about as terrible as saying, I'm going to make something that the kids like. There's no, you have no hope. If those words come out of your mouth, I'm going to make something that the kids like, you are not the person that's going to make something that the kids like. It's just not going to be you. Because the creative process is such that ultimately you're making all these little decisions and if you are not sort of of that world, your sensibilities are not likely to produce something that will feel authentic to those viewers. Um, in some sense. Now there's, there's people that can be atip, like you can look at them and say like, I don't know how they made this amazing thing that's so in depth into this subject, but they geeked out on it. I guarantee you that. They, you have to geek out on stuff to, and, and really dig in deep to, to reach that sort of authentic, you know, authenticity. 
that I think is important in this new age, and it's, I think, again, it comes back to the, the narrow casting community aspect of social media, which is that, you know, we're seeing like the, the coolest parts of, of, uh, of free market economics at work. The, the power of reputation is so on display in a world where you're discovering most of the things you watch by way of the, your friends and what they do and say. And that sort of vote of confidence is so important and it, it, it's, it's not something you can capture. And it's not something the media buys. Placing lots of ads can reproduce. It's too easy to ignore ads, which Facebook is finding out. Um, so the next, the next one I want to talk about is uh, this video game awards campaign we did called Look Closer. So one smart thing Spike did about the video game awards was they switched it from being a bunch of people coming up and talking about accepting an award to basically an, a video version of a mini um, E3 conference where they would show 10 to 12 trailers for games that haven't yet come out. So they made it, they made, made, they made it about content. And that was, a, that was a big step forward and we could see the difference in the way the show was being talked about, at least within the trades. The, the ratings never moved a lot, but the way it was received out into the community, out into the, the, blog, the blogosphere, and you know, when you looked at forums and looked at the way people were talking about it that were interested in games, that the tone began to shift. So all of the advertising became built around that, became built around, you're gonna see these amazing, never, never before seen premieres. And, uh, and that was pretty effective. So one of the things we said is, okay, well the problem of course is that you don't have to watch the show for that because they'll all be on YouTube within like 20 minutes of it being done broadcasting. So how can we add a little carrot to, to watch the show? How can we drive interest in the show itself and create that as a destination, a time slot that people might actually want to care about a little bit more rather than just being like blasted with, you know, you know, Sunday at nine, eight central, only on Spike. And uh, so the, one of the ways things we came up with was to, to bury essentially a, I think it was an 11th teaser within the promos. Uh, and we and so we actually created a tagline for the campaign called Look Closer, which was really flat-footed, but it worked. And it was just saying, literally, look closer at this promo because there's hidden stuff in it. That's really all it was. And the hidden stuff in it were um, a sequence of complicated, though not complicated enough, in my opinion, clues and breadcrumbs to, 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 to point you towards something. So, so, you know, there was a, a few frames of a QR code, which is that little square there. Um, and when you, you know, if, if you're not familiar with those, it, they're basically like a barcode, modern barcode, and, and, but they can contain more data. And uh, phone readers can, you know, pick them up if you've got a camera on your phone, and then they can take you usually to a link. And so when it took you to the link, you would see this little mobile site on the right, um, and, the, and, and it, these came out four times, and the first one just had the word murder. Look closer, murder. And another thing buried in the, in the spot was this, uh, this image. And we were working with Activision, who was providing this content. And, and it was for the promotion of, um, of one of their new titles, a big sort of sequel title for them. Uh, so yeah, so you would basically copy. And as it went through, the three f formed Murder Your Maker. And then I forget actually what the fourth one did, but it basically wrapped it up, showed murderyourmaker.com. And then, you know, when people went there, they found this sort of cryptic website. And because you can't really see who that is or which character that might be, that sparked, a, it, it, each time it came out, it sparked a whole debate. And we hadn't seen this type of sort of engagement with Spike within gaming blogs and essentially, and, and, and this world of people who actively talk about gaming on the web before. And I think that that was a real signal of success that we were um, reaching people and, and making them excited about the show, but also that they cared enough. And I think the effort of the, com the complexity sort of was a signal, and it was a signal that we were trying to, we were making an effort. <laughs>
I actually wanted it to be IP address numbers. So I didn't want it to be words. I wanted it to be four IP address numbers. And the brass was like, that's too complicated. But, but, but you know, the other thing, funny thing about these, these type of campaigns, I and mean, when you think about media and, and the kinds of things you can do, video is only one part of all sorts of tools at our disposal. And, um, and, our, and we can tell stories now that literally bridge between the, the screen and reality and real locations and, and, and there's just, it's like the sky's the limit with what we can do and how we can tell our stories. Um, and, the, and when it comes to something like this, I mean, it only takes one person to post the IP address and have it be hyperlinked. So it's really, the, like, it's hard to trick the crowd. Um, and that was the point I was trying to make. The more complicated it'll be, it really was just a signaling mechanism. The more it will encourage this group of people who we see are excited about this content, excited about gaming, want to want to see that we're excited, that we really put all the work into making it this circuitous process. But I think we 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 still got a lot farther than I said I thought we might have at the outset. So it, I think that was a, a successful campaign. And in in the show, so it all pushed towards the show, and in the show it was revealed that it was this game prototype two. Um, and again, the whole idea, the strategy, wasn't to go viral, because that's not a strategy. But the strategy was to make the show a point in time that could be sort of like a water cooler moment, something that people are excited enough about that they'll want to see it when it happens. Like a, I mean, one of the few things in media now that can still do that is sports. You know, you want to watch it live. You don't want to, you don't really want to watch a game DVR'd, even though, you know, people do. Um, but that sense of urgency is a very hard thing to try to create. And um, that hasn't gotten any easier with social media. Um, so yeah, it's in the impacts, as I talked about, was that the gaming press really uh, ran with it, which was pretty cool because we were entering kind of hostile territory. They were skepti skeptical of the brand. Didn't, we, you know, we were coming from a position of not having a lot of sort of credibility within, within the, the sort of community. And, and this helped build it. And it was because we geeked out, which is again the theme I'm gonna come back to again and again. We geeked out on it, and that made a difference. You know, and gamers talked about it, and you know, it, it, it contributed to increased respect for the show, immaterial of how effective it was at, at driving, um, driving views. And the funny thing, just from a business standpoint of the way these shows worked, is they're driven by integrated marketing. So even if the ratings weren't great, the fact that the show is being talked about for that entire promotional period, while all the various game developers that were part of the promotion were, were, were getting their messages out, was a value for them. So even even like in a, even in our sort of when we, when we try to imagine entrepreneurially, the business model of media is more diverse, more complicated, and often more um, indirect than it would seem. So here's just a couple uh, sites that picked it up. And these were not paid editorials. These were, these just happened. And there was a lot more. So yeah, I think, the, I think again, these key themes reemerge. You know, an activated fan base, a group of people, a community, and, and you're, not, you're, you're targeting that community um, but hopefully because you're of that community, you want to talk to them. Uh, you know, the complexity as a signal, which really ultimately was about, again, being authentically geeky about your subject, <laughs> geeking out. And nothing is more of a geek out than the Keynes versus Hyatt rap videos. <laughs> um, on paper, these are obviously kind of a ridiculous concept. It's two dead economists. Um, most of, you know, most Americans, most people in, on the planet don't know who either of them are. They're going to rap, which if you say in advance, it almost, you would almost, you would rightfully assume it's going to be cheesy, right? In fact, when, uh, when Russ would talk to his peers about it, which is admittedly maybe not the optimal group <laughs> to, uh, to float this idea and get a little sort of advanced feedback. They were like, this is, really? This is, 
okay, and you're part of it. But it wouldn't have been much better if I was saying it. I mean, my ringtone is um, Rapper's Delight. Not exactly the coolest cat in the room when it comes to music. Ask Michael Malice. <laughs> um, but it worked. So there's, a, and, and, it, and it wasn't cheesy. It, it, it was, it was fun and it was honest. And that, that, that's because we really geeked out on this. And there was a set of decisions that were both strategic and aesthetic for me. Um, and I think, I say that for me because I think Russ could have probably gone either way on some of these things. Since the video, the look and feel of it was very, was very much sort of my ter territory. Um, and, uh, you know, a big part of that is the fact that they're not really a satire, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit. So sort of, here, here's some stats about Fear the Boom and Bust. So it's, it's um, up to three and a half million views. And that doesn't include the reposts. There's been a lot of repostings. I think there's at least a half million more in just repostings of the video, which is really good for what this is, but it's not enormous by web standards. I mean, there's dramatically less, you know, in my view, important stories being told that get dramatically more views than this, as we all know. Uh, but I think within the context of what this is and the subject matter, and what's been done up to this point, I think this was a really solid success. Um, it's been voluntarily translated into over 12 languages, which you saw, if you were, saw the talk yesterday, you know, was mentioned in the video I showed about it. And that's this other thing that's really interesting about this world that we now live in, where you're broadcasting and there's a feed, the, the feedback isn't just people making comments, it's, it's derivations. You're mashing things up you're reposting, you're posting video uh, responses, um, and that level of engagement is both really interesting and a real opportunity to, to connect with people, but it also is, is just a sign of how much this new world favors being a geek. And I mean geek in the broadest sense, being really passionate about a subject t to the point where you engage in it for, for the sake of engaging in it you love it. So another very interesting thing about these is they're very dense lyrics in English and yet half of all the views have come from outside the United States. Um, and there was no thought on our part put into the distribution or if there had been we would have put actual captions in different languages embedded in it and have, instead of other people having to do that for us. Um, and I don't know how much that would have cost, but we, we didn't even think about doing that. We didn't even think about putting it in Spanish, which is really kind of dumb. Um, but but it just, you know, we were doing something again because it was our passion, because we had something we wanted to talk about that we thought was important. And that we, you know, if you were to, to record some of Russ and I's conversations as we were writing and rewriting it, there was just a lot of giggling going on the whole time. And if you've ever, if, you listen, if you're an Econ Talk listener, Russ has got the funniest laugh. I mean, it's, mine's goofier, but it's just, it's like a, it's just as warm. I have a lot of real warmth for the whole process because we just really enjoyed everything about it. Um, so another thing that's really surprising to me, especially during summers, because you would think maybe a lot of this is coming from schools, uh, Fear the Boom and Bus still gets about 2,500 views every single day, and it's so stable, I don't understand why that's happening. I mean, the stability of it is remarkable. It's like, you know, sometimes it'll go up, it'll rarely go below 2,500, but each and every day, 2,500 people see this, watch this thing. And, and we're not doing anything with it. We're not promoting it or anything. I, it's, I, it's baffling to me. <laughs> and, and, and it's also like, it's not like it's some newspaper or some you know, hub is picking it up and then you're seeing some kind of spike. It is like a flat line. You're going to see some of the, the, the graphs coming up next. Um, but before I move on to some more stats, because what I wanted to do with these was really talk about the statistics of it to the extent that I, I have access to them with the YouTubes, the, the way everything unfolded on YouTube, where views came from and how the trajectory of it, it, it went. Because it's, I think it's interesting 
and it's and it's sort of a good case study. And since we have two of them, and there's a remarkable remarkable amount of similarity in the way the two spread and were shared and the distribution between mobile and off off of YouTube with embeds, which would be something like Facebook, people like sharing it on Facebook versus on YouTube itself. Um, it, it suggests that there are ways in which if we want to try to build a, an online brand, um, whether it's for your organization or just for yourself and you want to basically create a new TV show on, on the web, that there is a certain sustainability that you can build. And there's some techniques, I think, and when I get, you know, as I move ahead, that appear to be useful techniques. I, I will equivocate a lot on, on this because it's changing so rapidly, each part of this process um, and each step, that I don't think there's any expertise in it to be had. It's all on a case-by-case -case basis. It's all a question of what you're trying to say and what's the best way to say that. And there's just no cookie-cutter formula. There's no such, there's no sitcom for the, for the web. There's no model like that that I think you can really adhere to. Um, and anybody that says they know it, I think is selling snake oil. They're like macroeconomists. <laughs> so um, here's a the path to a million views. Um, so now look, that that first week was pretty incredible. Now we had we still even with these we had great advantages that if you just put a site, a, a, a video up cold, um, it would be great to get and it's not easy to get. And that is like Russ had great friends at NPR and they ran a story that ended up going on the air on All Things Considered over the radio. That's 12 million listeners um, on day one. You know, that's not something that's easy to come by. But at the same time, I'm not sure how, I mean, that played an important role, no question about it. But to get, I think it's um, 136,000 people on the second day, I don't know how many of, it's such a difficult thing to imagine someone listening to the radio, or even if it's in a, in a podcast form, and taking action later. This is always a hard thing with Spike, uh, and, and just with, with the networks in general. Getting someone to take action in the future with this silly little message you've got that's one of a, m a million things that they don't care about that you're shoving at them. Um, but it, it most certainly helped. So uh, it took eight days to cross half a million. And then it took uh, a month, um, I'm sorry, two months to, to actually make it to a million. So the, the rate of fall off is very quick. And in terms of strategy, I think that does suggest that when, you, when you've when worked really hard on a, on a video and you want to get it out there and it's something that's a priority for you, it's worth it to think about what are, all, what are the ways you can get it out there quickly in that first week. It's a little bit of an opening weekend kind of moment. And Fight of the Century follows a very similar path. Um, but at the same time, I, I don't think that's a general rule because there are things that build with over time in a kind of attrition. And um, it does depend, but our experience with these suggests that it's worth it to say, well, how many other places, who can I get this in front of? And reach out to them. Say, I made this, what do you think? Do you, can you, would you share it with, you, with, with people? And a lot of sort of strategists of social media talk about influencers and people on Twitter that others respect that can push a message out to their followers and to their email lists. and, and um, that's, that's just a very new version of buying advertising. Only the currency at this point is much more about coolness and, and geek credibility than buying it. But that's still a currency that you have to earn and, and build and that's a challenge because part of these communities now is they're built on reputation. And they know, they're, they're very acutely aware, people that are in this space, of how easy it is to destroy your reputation by shilling so it, again, it just comes back to the geeking out and being authentic to what you're doing um, is, a, a, I think, a very, very important part of how you communicate in, in, in a world where people can reach out to you. So uh, Fight of the Century followed an, a, remarkable, a remarkably similar path. And 
when you think about it, there was no reason for Flight of the Century to succeed. It's a sequel that basically is replaying something that, I, you know, if you looked at the first one, you'd say, well, this is a novelty because it's so weird. But novelty and weird wears off when you do it again. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that was a, a, a real honest concern. Like, is this going to be something that it comes out of the gate and it basically is only hardcore fans of Hayek that watch it and, it, at, you know, within a week, that's end of story? And what is that going to look like? Um, you know, and is there going to be the same amount of media attention given the amount of overlap? Now, it's a, it is a different story and, you know, partly strategically, but mostly because I like to make stuff look really as awesome as possible. We tried to up the ante visually and musically and creatively. And I think we succeeded in that. And um, I think that definitely helped. But what, what, there's an interesting part of that too, which we'll get to in a bit. So, you know, Fight of the Century is one year younger than Fear the Boom and Bust. It's, but up to, to date, it's had 1.8 million views. Um, again, half of them are outside of the US. So, Again, I find that just remarkable, and it's the thing I never could have imagined. Like, this was, for me, per, on a personal level, this is so much more exciting, not just because of how much I love and, and care about these ideas and how important I think they are for our future, for my son's future, for civilization. Um, but, you know, we would make stuff on Spike and Nickelodeon and MTV that millions of people would see, but it just wasn't, it didn't have the same feel. Like, as a creative person, to have made this yourself. Now, it wasn't myself. There was a lot of people, but to not have, have it been basically handed to you and then distributed on somebody else's machinery, but to have it succeed in this way is so fulfilling. And you don't need to get a million views to, to have that be the case. If you get a thousand views, think about how amazing it is to make something yourself and have a thousand people you don't know all around the world see it. Like, that is miraculous. That is a marvel. And, it, and I think we, we, take for, we take it for granted now, but it is, prob it, it, it is one of the most amazing things of the past hundred years. It's the, it's the new printing press. And I, I've come to really believe that I think video is the pamphlet of the 21st century. And we can do it now. And in a way, the reason, partly because the people like to watch things, but I think also video does offer, you know, it is harder to do than writing, in a logistical sense, creatively writing is a very big challenge. It takes a lot of work, and it, you know, the shorter the shorter it is, the harder it is. But the resources and, and and the people that go into making a video is a way to separate what you're talking about from all the blogs and comments and chatter, and and that's going to continue to be the case. It's never going to be free from a time and resource standpoint to to create great content. So it's always going to be a chance for you to get a message out in a way that's different from writing a blog post, doing a Facebook post, and commenting a lot, of which I've done all of those things, mostly wastefully in my opinion, um, at least for me. So it also has this remarkably stable 2,000 or so views a day. Now, what's interesting is that Fight of the Century, even though in many ways I think it's got broader message, messaging in it, it's got a broader story and looks better, it is not as popular as Fear the Boom and Bust on an ongoing basis. And I'm not sure why that is. My guess is that Fear the Boom and Bust, because it's covering so much more of like an, a, a, it's even geekier than Fear Fight of the Century. Fight of the Century covers this kind of historical, philosophical arc about the role of government and top-down versus bottom-up and history. But Fear the Boom and Bust digs into Austrian business cycle theory point by point. <laughs> and so that's like super geeking out. And I also think that the macro aspects of it, even on the first half, the Keynesian model, is more applicable to students and what they're learning in an intro class. So I think there's, a, there's some forces at work that keep Fear the Boom and Bust more popular. Um, but at this point, it's not about which one came first, because the, the average new viewer is not really going to care about that out of the gate, see, seeing either one. It's just an interesting quirk of, of what's come about with these two things. 
and yeah, so it's been slightly less popular in the long run than Fear the Boom and Bust. But so now look at the graph uh, on its path to a million views. Um, pretty similar to, to Fear the Boom and Bust. Uh, it had a much higher, it had a significantly higher peak. And I think you can attribute that to the fact that it wasn't coming out of nowhere. This was the second one. And I had put out on, on uh, Facebook, on the Econ Stories Facebook page that it was coming and you know, tried to build anticipation for it. And um, that I think played a role. And that, that is gonna come to I think another very important trend I've noticed that a lot, that successful video content on the web tends to leverage consistency, which we have not done. I mean, we've only done two of these. Um, they still are in the realm of being a labor of love. Uh, but I think if you want to build a real audience, you have to consistently deliver for them. And some of the examples I'm going to show you do that. But this, I think this, this first day out of the gate demonstrates how having people already know about what you're doing, having established a fan base for your work um, is really important. You know, it crossed 500,000 views in seven days and one million in two months and 10 days. So when you actually look at these thing, two things side by side, it is remarkable how similar their trajectory is. They, they, they were released one year apart. And they are these singular kind of one-off moments. So again, it's only two data points. So we can maybe hop for joy a little bit. But it's still, um, but it does suggest a, a, a way in which these things tend to find an audience and then find a sort of water level. Um, so here's some more statistics. Uh, wait, let me see. So where are they watching? So um, you can see that it's a mix. There actually is a surprisingly high amount of people that are seeing it directly on the YouTube page. But right below that is embedded views. So, you know, a good portion of the people that are discovering this are seeing it embedded on blogs, shared on Facebook. And, um, and then mobile devices and the, and, and the channel page come up as a tiny portion. Although mobile ha has grown a lot and it grew a lot when you look at it in, that, in, the, first, in the first week, in the first month. Um, so, you know, it is being distributed people are finding it through their friends in large measure. And uh, that's just an amazing thing. I don't really know how you can sustain that, how you can make that happen. I don't think you can make it happen other than some of these trends and the way we want to talk about stuff and consistency and authenticity. I think that plays, that's the singular thing I think that I've come away look, watching all these different campaigns. If it's really smart, um, or funny or authentic, I think you've got the best chance possible. So, you know, so yeah, these key elements are, as I've said, you know, it's a, you know, a very activated fan base. I mean, maybe the only fan base more rabid than Apple fans is Austrian economics fans. <laughs> and, uh, I, I mean, I remember uh, the first time I got to do anything like this and speak in front of a group was at the Mises Institute. And the jokes that flew in that crowd were really something else, I have to say. Um, yeah, gold standard jokes and rapping. Really, you really know you're targeting a niche. <laughs> you can make a joke about how, uh, you know, rap is perfect for our Austrian economics because they're on the gold standard, you know? <laughs> Huh? <laughs> Still works. <laughs> um, you know, so mainstream media support was a big help, and obviously that's great. The mainstream media is not dead. It is the long part of that tail. It's the high, It's the peak. And I think it's a good thing to target, if possible, to think about, like, is this good enough? Or is this funny enough to be on television? It's still a useful way to, to go about things. I, 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 you know, we still have radio. So the, the talk of the death of television has been greatly exaggerated. We still have radio. We still have AM radio with people on it that are doing shows. It's not just for emergency broadcast. Um, I think for us, high production value played a very important role. 
and also taking the content seriously. It's not a parody. It's not meant to be goofy or funny, even though there's a humorous aspect to both of them. But they aren't really funny in, in a seeking to make people laugh sense. Just the notion of rapping economists is funny, and the fact that it is um, taken seriously is this kind of ironic humor. But fundamentally, they're not like comedy pieces, except for Mike Munger um, <laughs> at the beginning. <laughs> um, they are geeky, as I've said, no question about it. And um, the authenticity of them, I think, is baked into that geekiness, the attention to the economics and the details of the economic arguments that are being made, um, and, the, and, and in a sense, the sophistication of what's being done. You know, uh, by not dumbing it down, by not trying to make entirely ideological or very broad brush arguments, but dig into the details, I think one of the benefits that comes with that is credibility and authenticity. It shows you put in the time. It's a kind of signal. And you know, I think a lot of people that want to get a message out in organizations, and especially the larger the organization, the more established, the more conservative they're going to be about this, um, they don't want it to be too hard to understand. And we made no effort to make this easy to understand in a sense. Like all of these, these things are designed to be difficult in a way. They're lyrically dense, they're covering very complex subjects. Those subjects leverage arcane terminology that even we often struggle to make sure we even understand what, what, what they mean. And, um, and again, I think this ultimately ends up speaking back to that aspirational, that, that wanting to be smarter, wanting to learn more, and seeing something that's giving you a window into that. I think is a powerful thing. And we shouldn't shirk from that. We shouldn't be afraid to put a word in front of people that they don't, that the average person doesn't know. Because it's an opportunity for them to learn. And I think most people are curious. So I think it's worth doing. Don't be afraid to do it. Um, now, another thing from a strategic standpoint that I noticed as far as informing future strategy is the way in which uh, having the hit video really does, is, is sort of lifts all boats. So we also posted, and this was very much a labor of love on my part, just because I am geeking out about this stuff all the time, um, about 45 minutes of interview with Larry White and Robert Skidelsky. Now, I love Larry White. Um, he's not exactly the first guy you think of as TV. Um, <laughs> he is, he, but he's awesome, and he's one of the clearest expositors of these ideas, and the, probably one of the best, if not the best, um, economist in the Hayek tradition alive, from a macroeconomics and mon money sense. And uh, each of those videos has gotten 40, between 45 and 60,000 views. Now, when you compare that to the average sort of talking head video, it's pretty amazing. And I think that is directly the result of being associated and under the umbrella with these giant videos. And so as a strategy, and I realize most of you in here are students, but I think as a strategy for organizations, um, investing in creating a really awesome piece, a really high quality piece, doesn't have to be a one-off. It, in a sense, is advertising for the entire brand and your entire sort of stable of content. Um, so let's look to some other uh, web successes that I think, uh, and this is probably mostly confirmation bias on my part, if not entirely, but it's the best I can do. <laughs> um, I have a theory and I'm going to confirm it. Um, like a good, like good macroeconomist. So one that I really look at a lot is this YouTube channel by a guy named Freddie Wong. Have, have any of you seen Freddie Wong's YouTube videos? Okay, a couple. Um, so basically, every single week he puts up a new video about that's that's lever like making use of sort of game culture, and they're 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 humorous, they're little stories, they're they're satirical, and they're really high quality. They use lots of special effects and a lot of sort of um, uh, graphic sort of comic violence with guns and you know action battles. He's created. 3.3 million subscribers. 
It's enormous. He gets, he's had in total over 650 million views. I mean, this small team is, um, I think that might have been me. Um, this, his, this small team is beating the networks <laughs> with weekly views. And, uh, and, and part of that is because he targets gamers, which really, again, speaks to how important in, in a world where geography isn't, isn't the community, but interest is that being a geek is important and being able to be of the community of, of, of geeks and being able to speak in, that, in, in the language to your peers. It's a very peer-to-peer -peer world we live in. Um, that weekly, every week, that, that consistency, if we could do that, I, I really, my hat is off to the guys that learn Liberty um, because they're, they've, they've surpassed us, uh, they've surpassed the, our rap videos in total views for their channel and they've done so and in my, in my opinion, not just because the videos are quality and because they've got great content in them, but because they're consistently delivering, delivering them week after week. And I think that's just enormously important. It just seems to be a very consistent um, feature of successful sort of new media video channels. Um, a lot of themes seem to recur, comedy, absurdity, um, and I think high, high, high quality. High quality is quality is starting to, I think, more and more be a differentiator. This notion that you just put whatever you want up and quality doesn't matter anymore is was a very fad-like thought process. People like stuff that looks great. I mean, we're not going to all want to watch handheld video. We like stuff like Lost. Lost is awesome. Um, so yeah, he he exceeds one million views every single week, and most of the time it's a lot more than that. And I, I just think that there's, it's a pretty amazing feat and, and an opportunity. So the next one is sort of in a similar vein, and these two guys actually end up, I think, sort of sometimes cross-pollinating between each other. How many of you have seen Epic Mealtime? Okay, so more. So Epic Mealtime is interesting because it's the definition of the geekdom here is not as narrow in a sense. I mean, game, you know, to say gamers is kind of ridiculous because it's probably 150 million people in the United States. It's just, every, you know, everybody games in, in a sense. I mean, it's very, very popular. It's not, I mean, when, my, when my, my buddy Josh and I used to go to Blockbuster <laughs> when I was in high school and we'd be grabbing like Super Mario Brothers 3 and we'd see some girls <laughs> and be like, what are you guys getting? Oh, I'm just getting like a movie, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it was just uh... a... <laughs> You know, I don't know whether that feeling of stigma was justified or not. I mean, it kind of was, but uh, um, I think that era is over. I think everybody games, and it's not. A, it's, so it's, when I say gamers, that's not really a narrow niche, but it is an interest. It is defined. It is a subset. It's not just people 18 to 24 or 18 to 49. Like it's there. It, there is a shared interest. There's a shared language and and culture that is part of that. And that, in a way, is where the geekdom and, and the community comes in. So he has 2.5 million subscribers. So let me just describe what this is. Him, the, it's a group of Canadians. I saw them talk at South by Southwest. Uh, the guy's a former school teacher. And um, the main guy calls himself Muscles, uh, is it Muscles Glasses. Um, and uh, they literally go to the, they go to the supermarket they buy as much meat as they can. They go home and they cook it. And as they're cooking it, they scream what they're cooking. Bacon, more bacon, even more bacon. And it just cuts like bacon, bacon, bacon. Let's get some damn bacon. And, 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 and so, so in a way, like I don't know what, in, what group this falls into. <laughs> But it does do, it, it has other things to it. So it has that sense of absurdity. They're sort of more like of that kind of general, like geek culture. And, um, and it's funny as hell. And comedy, which is the most difficult thing in the world to pull off successfully, is probably the single best thing you can do to find an audience on the web, is be funny. So they've had four, 412 million total views screaming bacon once a week. <laughs> targeting geeks and video, you know, so they have this weekly, again, the weekly release schedule, they're building an audience. You see the first one and you're like, that was hilarious. I'll click subscribe, click, and then it comes out again the following week and you build affinity for 
what you're doing. You build an audience. They're your audience. They, they love what you're doing. I think it can't be underestimated how important that consistency is. And the two examples I'm going to bring up next are in stark contrast to what we've seen so far and yet apply the same basic principles. Um, and they, yeah, consistently beat with you. So, taking the exact opposite side of the spectrum, there are these makeup video blogs. So, I know, I know there's a lot of girls in the audience because it's fee and it's Austrian economics and liberty. How many of you have watched any of these um, uh, makeup video bloggers? Okay. So, yeah, how to make myself look like Jessica Alba or what? But I mean, but it's all kinds of different things. How to, you know, go to the grocery store and I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, but, you know, these are two examples. Um, each of them has 600 to 800,000 subscribers. Now these are, are stand in very co stark contrast to everything I've shown up to this point on a number of fronts. They are not highly produced. They are mainly a, a, the, the woman sitting in front of her webcam simply doing the work and talking about it pretty extemporaneously. They're not edited heavily. Uh, I mean, they're the exact opposite from a sophistic, vid visual sophistication standpoint. However, they do show tremendous craft. And these women are geeks of their craft. They take it seriously. And they do an amazing job. And that, I think, still plays into that broader theme. And they are ultimately finding an audience uh, of interest, of like-minded um, you know, interest and affinity. It, but each of them has gotten between 100 and 160 million views on their YouTube channel. Unbelievable. You know, so like, as I said, they're targeting makeup geeks. Um, again, weekly releases. So now these don't reach the same level, and I think the things like comedy and production value and are part of what bring the, the prior examples up higher, but they're getting a consistently 250,000 views every week. Now, um, that beats most of cable news. I mean, it certainly beats most of non-Fox cable news, whether you love or hate Fox. I mean, that, that's probably beating the entire week for CNN. <laughs> so, yeah, I realize it is, yeah, it's a low standard. Um, so, but I mean, that's just incredible. And it's, the, you know, so it's, an, it's, it's, it does suggest that these, there is a, a certain degree of consistency here, even when you take radically different subject matter and audiences and look at where they line up and where you see common uh, tactics and common strategies and common ways of doing things. The very community nature of these videos in particular, the ways in which in the videos, um, the, the girls will actually talk back to their you know, various commenters from the prior week. They will solicit um, requests for a look to do. And that type of engagement is, is also something that never was really possible before. Um, but is, is amazing. It's an amazing new thing. Like, you know, Russ has said to me that he really thinks that we fundamentally learn through discourse, through talking with one another. It's part of why lectures like this in, a, in some ways kind of suck. Because you're all sitting and I'm talking. And the way we really get into things and understand them is to have a conversation to test what we know and partly test what we think we know by trying to say it in a way that somebody else can understand. And what, what social media, what, what digital distribution gives you the opportunity to do is actually do that, but with the tools of broadcast. Because the chances are, if you've got 100,000 viewers, there's not necessarily going to be 100,000 different questions. You might have top 10 questions that cover most of the main things that people have a question about. And, um, and you, you see, I think, that dynamic starting to play out in some of these um, educational startups that are offering sort of video classes, things like Udacity and Khan Academy and, and, uh, and Learn Liberty. Um, but even the, but the ones that are really trying to target, like you're going to walk through a specific course curriculum, but do it using these tools. You know, I think there's a lot of 
um, in sort of educational upheaval that is only just beginning. And nobody is more excited to destroy the way these things are taught than me. You know, if, if, it, if, if I could eliminate the entire concept of the way introductory macroeconomics is taught and replace it with something more akin to fear the boom and bust, I mean, that is a personal mission of mine. And thinking about how to do that is, occupies a lot of my time. Um, but we can now. We can destroy it. We can take on some of these institutions that have been doing damage to our, our civilization and our understanding of the world and just and we're, we can be like educational agorists we can just ignore them and go right around pretend they don't exist we and we don't even need to complain about them just go direct to the people and that's the most exciting thing about social media to me so I've gone over this a lot but it bears repeating the, are the lessons we've learned you know um, targeting an activated audience. And again, targeting suggests that let's go after what the kids like. Um, this is more of a result than a choice, I think, when you're doing it well. You want to tell your story, and your story is, is, you know, is part of a, there's a community or a cultural affinity there. There's a group that you are a part of, or a group that you want to reach that you are trying to speak to. Trying to speak to and, and, and this is what you're going to do. You're not going to try to reach everybody, even if you ultimately it'd be nice for it to be accessible to everybody, but it doesn't always need to be. Um, being authentic and of the audience is, I just think, consistently across all of the videos that are not just a one-off. One-offs happen all the time, but the ones that 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 and don't apply to any of this stuff. You know, kids bit, you know, little kids biting each other's fingers and all kinds of things that get enormous one-off success, and that's it. They're the black swans, forget about them. Um, the consistent audience builders, I think, are employing some flavor of these and many other techniques. Demonstrating expertise, which um, was a part of that great uh, public speaking talk we heard yesterday. Um, being great at something and then showing people is cool. It's, it's, it's neat to see other people that are really good at stuff. And, um, and it, is, it is a kind of aspirational thing. But to me, that also suggests, you know, find your comparative advantage and really dig into that. And if you want to try to reach people using video, think about, don't think about what, what's the big topic we can cover. Think about what you're really great at and how you can do it. And if it applies to video, then do it that way. But really stay, you know, um, Leverage what you're great at, leverage your comparative advantage, and that, I think, is you're going to ultimately be your, hot, your best asset in the process. Um, and when you do that, I think you will have and you will earn that geek credibility that seems to be pretty important on the web and on, in a world where you know, people are picking and choosing where they're, what they're engaging in. And that's part of why this happens. We, we, you know, there's a birds of a feather part of this human experience, and it's applying more, we're seeing it unfold on the web because of that, because of human nature. And lastly, consistency, 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 which we haven't followed with the wraps just because of resources and time. And um, we've been busy doing other things as well, like cronies action figures. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, if, if you want to try to do something where you're going to create an audience, um, do it. Commit yourself to doing it. I probably weekly. You know, Russ's podcast Econ Talk comes out every week. It's a big part of its success. One of the first video blogs that was noteworthy and successful was by a guy, I don't know if this was actually his name or not, called Zay Frank. How many of you have ever seen Zay Frank? Okay, Chuck has up there. Um, I think he posted a new video every day. And he actually, in a sense, established this technique of talking fast into the camera and then hard cutting really rapidly and sort of, you know, making it this abrupt, somewhat abrupt and, and like syncopated feeling experience that's really punchy. Where you're just seeing, you're just, you know, it's just cutting hard and you're saying things and then you're looking away and you're saying, you're repeating yourself. And, 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 um, and a big part of his success, and he, he said it, I think he did it every single day for a year. 
So it just, it literally became appointment viewing. It became something that you built into your habit. We are habitual creatures. And I think that's why consistency is such an important force for trying to reach people on the web. Um, and, uh, and that's it. So, uh, do you have any questions? Hi. Um, what do you think are the most relevant groups uh, for us to be reaching in order to advance liberty? And um, when reaching groups outside of the already Austrian economics community, um, do you have any suggestions to really be able to be authentic with them and connect with them? Um, I can't really answer how to be authentic because it is entirely a matter, it's a sub very subjective thing and it really is based on you. Um, I mean, that's sort of the nature of it, right? That's the nature of, of, of authenticity. It's sort of coming from who you are and what you want to say. So trying, I think being honest is a really great starting point. Um, and challenging yourself, challenging your own biases, uh, not, you know, finding your own understanding of these ideas that doesn't sound like everyone else and everything you've read. I think is really important because we have a lot of the same way of talking about this. We have a lot of different ways too. Um, and the great thing about the tradition and all the, all the work that's been done to restate what essentially is a fairly small and uh, set of ideas in millions of different ways means we can retell other people's ideas, just steal. You know, Steve Jobs said, great artist steal, he's darn right. Steal it, steal the great stuff. Take it from everywhere you can find it. Um, as far as reaching people outside of the group, I would say Jesus Christ did a pretty good job of that. And what he did was, and I'm not, again, I'm not a uh, expert on Big J, but um, he used parables, right? He told stories that were not, um, that, that made sense to the people he was talking to, that used their experiences. He found the things that people could understand and find that point of reference. And so I think the first step to, I think this is, and this is just for, I think, communication in general. When you want to talk to somebody that, that doesn't already think like you, has, isn't already steeped in your ideas, find, find a common ground and build back up from there. Find the place where you agree. Now I realize that's easier in a conversation, but if you're gonna put a video out and you're, you're, you want people of a particular co community orientation, however that you wanna define that, to see it that isn't just 75% white male libertarians, um, I think it would really be helped at least Try, reach out and try to get some understanding, even even in the crudest sort of just having conversations with people that disagree, that don't, that look at the world a different way, and find where their baseline is, where are the places that you agree, build back up from there. So, um, you know, we talked about like you know the anything peaceful. You know, a lot of people that came into Ron Paul, uh, and and by by virtue of being excited about him, got exposed to our ideas, came in through anti-war and through other issues or drug legalization. Um, and those are still fundamentally about our, our freedoms and, and our liberty and our ability to um, chart our own course and not have it either destroyed or have it forbidden. And that's a, that's a starting point. That can be, a, that's, I think that's a great starting point. Um, and then go with that and find the parables that you can tell. <laughs>